Welcome back to New York City, everybody. This is theCUBE's coverage of MongoDB World 2022. Dave Itachiri is here. He's the president and CEO of MongoDB. Thanks for spending some time it's with us. It's great to be here, Dave. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. So, your keynotes this morning, you know, I, I was hearkening back to Steve Ballmer running around the stage <laughs> screaming, developers, developers, developers. You weren't jumping around like a madman, mm -hmm. but the message yeah. was the same, and you've not deviated from that message. I remember when it was 10 gen, so yes. you've been consistent. Why is MongoDB so alluring to developers? Yeah, because I would say the reason we're so popular, Dave, is that our whole business was founded on the ethos of making developers incredibly productive, right? Just getting the infrastructure out of the way so that the developer can really focus on what's important, that's building great applications that transform their business. And the way you do that is you look at where they spend most of the time. And they spend most of the time working with data. How do you present data, the right data, the right time, the right place, in the right way? And when you remove the friction of working with data, you unleash so much more productivity, which people just say, oh my goodness, I can move so much faster. Product leaders can get products out the door faster than the competitors. Senior level executives can seize new opportunities or respond to new threats. And that was so profound during COVID when everyone had to think about pivoting their business. When you came to MongoDB, what, what why did you choose this company? Uh, what was it that excited you about it? I, I get that question a lot. Um, I would say conventional wisdom would suggest that MongoDB was not a great choice. Uh, there weren't that many um, companies who were very successful in open source. Red Hat was the only one. Um, no one had really built a deep technology company in New York City. They, they say you got to do it in the Valley. Um, and uh, you know, um, database companies need a lot of capital. Now, it turns out that raising capital of, you know, this past decade was a lot easier, but it still takes a lot of time, a lot of capital, so you have to have a lot of patience. When I did my diligence, I was actually a VC before I joined right. uh, MongoDB, um, the whole next generation database segment was really taking off. And actually I looked at some competing investments to MongoDB, and when I did my diligence, it was clear even then, and this is circa 2012, that MongoDB is way ahead in terms of customer attraction, commercials, and even kind of developer mindshare. And so I ended up passing on those investments and then lo and behold, I got a call from a, a very senior executive recruiter who said, Dave, you got to take a meeting with, the, you know, with MongoDB. There's something really interesting going on. And they had raised a lot of capital and uh, they had just not been able to kind of really execute uh, uh, in terms of the opportunity, and they realized they needed to make a change, and so one thing led to another. One of the things that really actually convinced me is when I did my diligence, I realized the customers they had loved MongoDB. It just, they just really weren't executing on all cylinders. And I always believe you never bet against a company whose customers love the product. And so there's something here. The second thing I would say is open source, yes, it's true that open source was not very successful, but that's open source 1.0. Open source 2.0 was the technology is much better than, than the commercial options. Um, and so that convinced me. And then New York, I mean I lived in New York a big part of my life. I think New York's a fabulous place to build a business. There's so much talent, your customers are right, you know, you walk out the door, there's customers all over the place. And getting to Europe is, is very easy, almost like flying to the West Coast. So it's, it's a very central place to build a business. And it's, and it's easier to fix execution, wouldn't you say, and maybe even go to market than it is to fix a product that customers really don't love. Correct, yeah. correct. Yeah. It's much easier to fix leadership issues, culture issues, execution issues. Nailing product market fit is very, very hard, and there were signs, there's still some issues, there's still some rough spots, but there are a lot of signs that this company was very, very close, and that's why I took the bet. And this is before there was that huge influx of capital into the you know, separating compute from storage and right. the whole cloud thing, um, which is interesting because you take a company like Cloudera, they got caught up in that and got kind of washed over. Uh, and, and I guess you could argue Hortonworks did too and they could have dead-ended right. both and then that just didn't work. But, but it's interesting to see Mongo, the, the market kind of came to you and that is, really does speak to the product. It wasn't a, a barrier for you. I mean, you guys have obviously a lot of work to get into the cloud with Atlas, but it seemed like a natural fit. Uh, with the product, it wasn't like a complete fork. Well, I think the challenge that we had was we had a lot of adoption, but we had a tough time commercializing the business, right? And at some point, I had to tell the whole employees, it's great that we have all these people who are using MongoDB, but if you don't start you know, generating revenue, 
our investors are going to get tired of subsidizing this company. So I, I had to try to change the culture, and as you can imagine, the engineers didn't really like the salespeople, and the salespeople thought the engineers didn't really want to make any money. And what I said, like, let's all galvanize around customers, and let's make them really excited and try and create a lot of value. And so we just put a lot more discipline in terms of how we prosecuted deals, we put a lot more discipline in terms of the, what are the problems we're trying to solve, uh, and one thing led to another, we started building the business brick by brick. And one of the things that became clear for me was that the old open source model of trying to find that happy medium between what you give away and what you charge for is, is always a tough game, like, because finding that where the paywall is, if you give away too many new features, you don't make any money. If you don't give away enough, you don't have any adoption. So you're caught in this you know, catch-22. The best way to monetize open source is open source as a service. And we saw Amazon do that, frankly. We learned a lot from how Amazon did that. And one of the advantages that MongoDB had that I didn't fully appreciate when I joined the company, but I was very grateful for it, is that they had a much more um, uh, restrictive license, which you end up actually changing and make, made it even more restrictive, um, um, which allowed us to, to protect ourselves from being cannibalized um, by the cloud providers so that we could build our own business using our own IP that we had invested in and create a cloud service. That was a huge milestone. And of course you have great relationships with all the cloud providers, but it got contentious there for a while. But I mean, you give the cloud providers an inch, they're going to take a mile. That's just the way, you know, they're aggressive like that. But thank you for going through the history with me a little bit, because when you go back to the IPO, I think the IPO was 2017, right? Correct. I always tell young investors, my kids especially, don't buy a stock at IPO, you're going to have a better chance. But the, the, the window for Mongo was very narrow. <laughs> you know, so, you didn't really get a much better chance, a little bit, but now, and then it's been a rocket ship since then. Sure, there's been some volatility, but you look at some of the big IPOs like a Facebook or a Snap or even a Snowflake, I mean, you know, there was better opportunities, but you guys have executed really, really well. I mean, that's part of your ethos and your, and your, and your management team. And it came across on the earnings call recently. Yep. You, you set, um, a, it was very optimistic, yet at the same time you set cautious tones and you got, I think, high marks Yes. for some of that, that caution, but that execution. So, um, talk about where you feel the business is, is today, given the economic uncertainty. Well, what I'd say is we feel really good about the long term. We feel like the secular trends are really in our favor. I mean, software is fundamentally transforming every industry, and people want to use modern software to, to either automate you know, inefficient processes, enable new capabilities, drive better customer experiences, and the level of performance and scale you need for today's modern applications is profoundly different than uh, applications yesterday. So we think we're well positioned for that. What we said on the earnings call was that we started seeing a moderation of growth, slight moderation of growth in our low end of the business in Europe. It was in our self-serve business and in the SMB space uh, for the, in Q1, towards the end of Q1. And we saw a little bit of that show up in the self-serve business in May in uh, uh, Q2, and that's why um, while we raised guidance, we basically quantified the impact, which is roughly about 30 to 35 million for the year, based on what we saw. And we, in, in that assumption, we assumed like, you know, we just can't assume it's going to only be at the low end of the market. It'll probably be some effect at the enterprise market. Maybe not as much, but there'll be some effect, so we need to factor that in. And we wanted to help kind of investors have some sort of framework to think about what the impact is. We didn't, we didn't want to be one of those companies that said absolutely nothing. And we don't want to be the some companies that just wave the hand, but then it wasn't really that useful for investors. Yeah, I thought it was substantive. You, you talk, talking about those, those market trends, you, you cited three things that, you know, the developers recognize that the, there are limits to legacy RDBMS. You talked about the, what I call point solutions yep. creep. And then the document model is the best for developers. And, Correct. And, and so, my, and, and when, the conversation turned to consumption. Yep. Everybody's concerned about consumption, obviously. You said, my take, you're somewhat insulated from that because you're running mission critical apps. Uh, it's not discretionary. Uh, my question to you is, should we rethink the definition of mission critical? You, know, you think of Oracle mission critical running a bank. Mission critical today in this digital world seems to be different, is that fair? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, gosh, I mean, when's the last time you ever saw a website down? Like, I mean, if you're running like any kind of digital channel where you're engaging with your customers or your partners or your suppliers, you need to be up all the time, right? And uh, so you need a very resilient, highly available data platform. It needs to be highly performant, so as you add more users, you need to be scale. 
And we saw a lot of that in, when COVID hit, like companies had to completely repivot. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we talked about some examples where like a health and beauty re retailer who was all kind of, you know, basically retail had to suddenly pivot to an e-commerce strategy. We've had streaming and gaming companies suddenly saw this massive influx of demand that to scale their operations very, very quickly. So, so um, I would say anytime you're engaging with customers, um, customers, you know, they're so used to the kind of the consumer facing applications. Uh, I almost joke like slow is the old, you know, the old down. If you're not performant, it's, it doesn't matter. They're going to abandon you and go somewhere else. So if you're an e-commerce site and you're not performing well and not serving up you know, the, the right SKUs, depending on what they're looking for, they're going to go somewhere else. It's a, it's, a, it's a click away. You talk about a $100 billion TAM. Um, maybe that's even undercounted as you start to bring new capabilities in there. But there's no lack of market Correct. for you. How, how do you think about um, the, the market opportunity? Well, um, we believe, like again, software is transforming so many industries. IDC says that 750 million applications would be built over the next two to three years in 20, mm -hmm. by 2025. To put that number in perspective, that's more apps that will be built in the next three to four years than were built in the last 40. The rate and pace of innovation is, is exploding. And, and people are building custom applications, right? I'm not, people, yes, it, you know, Workday, Salesforce, um, you know, other companies, commercial companies are great companies, but my competitors can use Workday or Salesforce, or, you know, some of those commercial companies. That doesn't give me a competitive advantage. What gives me a competitive advantage is building custom software that better engages my customers, that transforms my business when adding new capabilities or drives more efficiency. And the applications are only getting smarter. And so you're seeing that innovation explode and that plays to our strength. People need platforms like MongoDB to build the next generation of applications. So Atlas is now roughly 60% 60, 60 of your business. I think is growing at 85%. So it's, it's the, the, at least the midterm future. But my question to you is, is it the future? Because when we start to think about the edge, it's not necessarily the cloud. It's, you know, you're not going to be able to go that round trip and the latency. And we had Verizon on earlier, talking about what they're doing with 5G and the mobile edge. Is Mongo, positioning for that edge, and, and is the, our definition of cloud changing, where it's not just on-prem and across clouds, but it's also out to the edge, this continuous experience. Right, so I'll make two points. One, we definitely believe that. We believe the applications uh, of the future will be mobile first, um, or purely mobile, because one, with the advent of 5G, the distinction between mobile and web is going to blur, uh, with 100 times faster networking speeds. Um, um, but the second point I make is that how that shows up on our revenue, on our income statement, will look like Atlas because we don't charge nothing uh, for the end, you know, you know, uh, point. We it's basically driving consumption of the back end, and so we've you know introduced a bunch of very very sophisticated capabilities to synchronize data from the edge to the back back end and vice versa with things like flex flexible sync. So we see so many customers now using that capability. Um, whether you're field service technicians, whether you're a mobile first company, et cetera. So, so that will drive Atlas revenue. So on, a, on an income statement, it'll look like Atlas, but we're obviously addressing those broader set of mobile uh, needs. You talk a lot about product market fit, you know, former VC, of course. Uh, Mark Andreessen says, you, you, you product market fit, you kind of know when you see it, your hair's on fire, you can't buy a service. How do you know when you have product market fit? Well, one, we have the luxury of lots of customers. So they tell us pretty clearly when they're happy and we can see that by usage behavior. Now the other benefit of a cloud service is we can see the level of activity. We can see the level of engagement. We can see how much data they're consuming. We can see you know, all the actions they're taking. So you get the fidelity of feedback you get from Atlas versus someone doing something behind their own firewall and you kind of call them and check in on them is very, very different. So that level of insight gives us visibility in terms of what products and features are being used. It gives us a sense that it had things going well or is there something awry? Maybe they have misconfigured something or they don't know how to use some capabilities. So the level of engagement that we can have with a customer using a service is so much different. And so we've really invested in our customer success organization so the byproduct of that is that our retention rates are also very, very strong because you, you have such better information about what's happening in, in terms of your, your, your customers. You see retention in, in real time. You've been somewhat, I mean, it's hard to say this because you're growing at 50% a year, but, but you're somewhat conservative about, about the pace of hiring for go-to-market. And um, I'm curious as to how you think about scaling, especially when you build, when you introduce new products. I mean, Atlas is you know, several years ago, but as you extend your capabilities and add new products, how do you decide when to scale? 
So it's, uh, it's a constant process. Um, we've been quite aggressive in scaling our organization for a couple of reasons. One, we have very low market share, so the market's vastly underpenetrated. I s we still don't have reps in every NFL city in the United States, mm -hmm. which is kind of crazy. Uh, there's other parts of the world that we are just still vastly underpenetrated in. So, but we also look at how those organizations are doing. So if we see a team really killing it, we're going to deploy more resources because one, it tells us there's more opportunity there and there's a strong team there. If we see a team that maybe is struggling a little bit, we'll try and uncover, rather than just plowing more resources in, we'll try and uncover what are the issues and make sure we stabilize the organization and then devote re resources. It's all in the measure of like being very disciplined about where we deploy our resources to get those kind of returns. And on the product side, we obviously go through a very iterative process and kind of do rank order all the projects and what we think the expected returns are. Obviously, we look at the customer feedback, we look at what our strategic priorities are, and that informs you know, what, what projects we fund and what projects kind of are below the line. And we do that over and over again every quarter. So every quarter we revisit the business. We, ha we have a very QBR-centric culture, so we're constantly you know, checking in and seeing how the business is operating, and then we make those investment decisions. But in general, we've been investing very aggressively in terms of expanding our reach around the world. It seems like, well, with Mongo, your product portfolios, from an outside observer standpoint, it seems like you've always had pretty good product market fit, but I was curious, in your VC days, would you ever encourage companies to, to scale, go to market prior to having confidence in product market fit, or did you always see those as sequential activities? Well, I think the challenge is, um, you know, if you, if you wait, I mean, it, 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 this part, it's uh, analysis, part is judgment, right? So you don't necessarily have to have perfect product market fit to start investing, but you also don't want to plow a bunch of resources and realize the product doesn't work and then now you're burning through a lot of cash. So there's a little bit of art to the process. Um, you know, when I joined MongoDB, I could tell that you know, we had a strong engineering team, they knew how to build high quality products, but we just struggled with commercialization. The culture wasn't great across the company and, um, and we had some you know, leadership challenges. So that's what I, when I joined, I kind of focused on those things and tried to bring the organization together and slowly we started chipping away and making feel like, people feel like they were winners. And once, once you start winning, that becomes contagious, right? And then, and then the nice thing is when you start winning, you get a lot more customer feedback, you get more, you know, um, that feedback helps you refine your products even more, which then adds, you know, it's like the flywheel effect that starts taking off. Yeah, so um, it seems the culture's working now. Do you have a, a, a favorite product from the, uh, the announcements <laughs> today? Um, well, I really like our foray into analytics, and, it's, and um, essentially, um, you know, uh, what we're seeing is really two big trends. One, um, um, you're seeing applications get smarter. What applications are doing is really automating a lot of processes, and rather than someone having to press a button, you know, based on, on analytics, you can automate a lot of decision making. So that's one theme that we're seeing as applications get smarter. Uh, the second theme is that people want more and more insights into what's happening. And the source of those insights is your you know, operational database, right? Because that's where you're you know, having transactions, that's where you know what products are selling, that's where you know what customers are buying. So people want more and more real-time data versus waiting to you know, <clears throat> you know, take that data, put it somewhere else, and then run reports, and then get some update you know, at the end of the night or maybe at the end of the week. So <clears throat> that's driving you know, a lot of really interesting use cases that especially when you marry in things like time series use cases where you're collecting a lot of data, people want to see on trend analysis, what's happening. Um, we see that's a very exciting area. We introduced a very cool feature called queryable encryption, which basically, the problem with encrypting data is you can't really query it because by definition it's encrypted. Yeah, you're right. <coughs> but obviously data security is very important. What we announce is we're using very sophisticated cryptography. People can do, um, query the data but they don't have really access to the data. So it really protects you from like data breaches or you know, um, malicious users accessing your data, but you still can kind of make that data usable. So that was a very interesting uh, uh, announcement that we made today. Sounds like magic without the performance hit. Yes. Right? You, could, you can do that. Dave, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Congratulations uh, on all the activity. I mean, bumper sticker on day one. Oh, super exciting. Um, the energy was palpable. You know, 3,300 people in the room, uh, lots of customers, lots of users. We have lots of investors here as well for Investor Day. Um, we have a dinner tonight with a bunch of senior execs, so it's, it's been a busy day. Future is bright for <laughs> MongoDB. Dave, Dave, thanks for so much for coming on theCUBE, and uh, thanks for watching. This is Dave Vellante, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>